Welcome to Windy Night Stories. Tonight's story is a weird one by Joan Aiken. It's called, Who Goes Down This Dark Road? It seems singular, remembering that first interview with Mrs. King, to think that I had no kind of premonition or foreknowledge, and yet how could I have had? If I had known, or guessed, that my intervention would result in my being brought here, would end in this tedious incarceration, I might have let well enough alone, but I did not. Amanda King had not made any particular impression on me, save as a very good little girl. Among the children in the beginner's group, she was not distinguished for brightness at her lessons, nor for liveliness in class. She did not have that spontaneous vivacity and wit that some small children possess, nor was she in any way remarkable when the children played games or sang songs or acted plays or told stories. And yet, by the time Mrs. King came to see me, I was aware of Amanda as a particularly stable and pleasant member of the group. Stable seems an odd term to apply to a six-year-old, yet stability seemed to be Amanda's paramount quality. She was always punctual, polite, and friendly. Indeed, she had charming manners. I had at first assumed that it was Mrs. King who prompted the daily and very tastefully arranged posies, sometimes from the King's Garden, sometimes wildflowers, but by degrees I realized that this was Amanda's own idea. Her appearance was in no way striking, yet there was something neat and attractive about her. Her dark blue school pinafore and white blouse were always clean and crisp, her fair hair shining, beautifully brushed, and neatly braided, her big gray eyes serious and attentive to what was going on. She seemed a model pupil, and though she never came first in any subject apart from spelling and deportment, seemed unlikely to ever cause either parents or teachers the slightest worry. It was, therefore, a considerable surprise when Mrs. King came to see me visibly distressed one afternoon after school when I was setting up the model Saxon village for the next days of an intermediate class. Oh, Mr. Thornycroft, I'm ever so sorry to trouble you when I know how hard you work for the children, but me and Mr. King are worried about Amanda. We don't know what to do for the best. About Amanda? I was really amazed but she's the best little girl in the school. I know, sir, and so she's always been at home. But just lately something's got into her, something, well, peculiar. She's turned that obstinate, sir. I can't give you any idea. Well, even the best children go through awkward phases, I began vaguely and consolingly. What form does it take with Amanda, Mrs. King? Sir, it's to do with her hair. Her hair? Then it did occur to me that for the last week or so, Amanda's hair had not been so shiningly neat and symmetrically braided as hitherto. And indeed that very morning, I now recalled, Amanda had turned up with the two corn blonde plates shorn off and her hair hanging loose and rather short about her small, serious face. I made some remark on it, and she had said, Mom thought it would be easier to keep it neat if it was short. The child next to her, Lily Thatcher, called out, you ought to sleep with the braids under your pillow, Mandy. Then you'll dream about the fellow you're going to marry. Which raised a laugh, but Amanda, rather oddly, I now recalled, said she had buried the braids in the garden. What about her hair, then, Mrs. King? Well, sir, I don't know how to put it to you so you won't think either I or the child is crazy. I noticed with astonishment that the placid-seeming Mrs. King had tears in her eyes. But she's got this notion that there's people living in her hair. Various possibilities flashed through my mind. I said delicately, You're quite sure, Mrs. King, that it's not a simple case of nits, head parasites, something like that? Sir, how could you think such a thing? There's some families in this village I wouldn't put it past them, but my Amanda's hair has always been perfectly clean. I've washed her hair myself every Saturday night since she was born. I must say her hair always does look beautifully clean, I said quickly. Well, if that is the case... You don't think it's possible that she imagines she has something of that sort? Children sometimes have such odd private worries. No, sir, no, it's not like that. No, it's people, she says, are living on top of her head. In among the hair, like. She says, Mrs. King faltered. She said the hair seems like a forest to them. She's playing a game with you, Mrs. King, I suggested. It's just a piece of pretense. I remember when I was a boy, I had an imaginary bear. Oh, I carried him around with me for years. A game it may be, sir, but it's dead serious to her, Mrs. King said worriedly. 
Every day I have the very deuce of a job, if you'll pardon me, sir, to get her hair brushed. Don't do that, Mom. You'll drive them out into the forest, she said. And she screams and screams. It makes my Joe really wild. He's threatened to give her a good hiding if she won't be more reasonable. And lately, sir, oh, I began to wonder if she's going mental. Mrs. King here fairly burst out crying. She talks such rubbish, sir, all about chariots and temples and sacred stones and armies and navies. It's not right, sir. It really isn't. And sometimes what she says doesn't make sense at all. It's not proper language. You can't make head or tail of it, and she'll go on like that for hours. Did you mention this to Dr. Button? Well, I did, sir. I didn't take Amanda to the office for fear of scaring her. I just told him, and he fairly snapped my head off and said she was a perfectly healthy child and not to fuss him with a little bit of kid's moonshine. This sounded true to form. I said cautiously, well, what did you want me to do, Mrs. King? Oh, sir, if you would just talk to Amanda about it a bit. She thinks the world of you, sir. If you could just reason this nonsense out of her head. Very aptly put, Mrs. King. She looked at me rather blankly, so I promised that I would see what I could do. Supposing I take Amanda for a walk, Mrs. King, tomorrow after school, I could ask her to show me where she picks her delightful bunches of flowers. Then it won't seem too much like a formal interview. Oh, Mr. Thornycroft, I don't know how to thank you. I pointed out that I hadn't done anything yet, but she went away evidently relieved to have pushed the responsibility on to someone else, even if only temporarily. Next afternoon, Amanda agreed with grave politeness to take me across the common and show me where she picked her cowslips and lady smocks. I thought there was no sense in deferring the questions, so as soon as we were away from the village, I said, Your mother asked me to talk to you, Amanda, about this idea you have that her people are living in your hair. She looked up at me calmly with a surprisingly adult expression in her gray eyes and said, Yes, I thought perhaps she had. I said, gently, not wanting to seem unsympathetic or mocking, What sort of people are they, Amanda? She answered at once, They're a tribe of Gauls, the Venetii. They were defeated, you see, by the Romans in a big sea battle and driven out of their homes. They built a new town, but then it was destroyed. It sank in the sea. And so they collected up what they could of their belongings, and now they live in my hair. It's like a forest to them, you see. I was startled, to say the least. But Amanda, how did you come to know about the Venetii? I can hear them, she said matter-of-factly, talking through my skull. But they were a long time ago, more than two thousand years. I suppose they got through it fast somehow. Some people go quicker than others. I said, how could they all get onto your head, though? They were a full-sized people, a whole tribe of them. How could they all camp on one little corn-colored nut? She gave me a look as closely approaching to impatience as natural politeness would permit. Things seem a different size, don't you see, when they're in different places? If I saw you a long way off, you'd look small, wouldn't you? Or if I saw you beside a huge monster, her eyes widened, and I remembered that, after all, she was still only a six-year-old. The word relative was probably outside her vocabulary. What sort of language do they talk, these people, Amanda? I wondered where she had read or heard of the Venetii, who, I recalled, had been vanquished by Caesar in Brittany. Well, they talk two languages, she told me. Can you remember any of the words? She reeled off a string of jargon which was meaningless to me, full of X sounds and CH sounds. I became more and more interested remembering medical cases of glossolalia, speaking with tongues, which sometimes occurs in religious fanatics or mental patients. But in an otherwise matter-of-fact little girl of six? And what is the other language? She then started me out of my wits by replying, Una sala victus nullum spere salutum. There is but one safe thing for the vanquished, not to hope for safety. Good heavens, Amanda, where did you hear that? One of them up there said it. She pointed to her flaxen locks. Can you remember any more? Quid nunce it per ita tangerusum? Iliuk, I said it with her. Unde negate nadire requirum. You know that too, she said, turning the gray eyes on me? I have heard it, yes. What was the people's town called, Amanda, the town that sank in the sea? It was called Is. Do you know the names of the gods they worship? 
They must not be spoken or written down. There is a serpent's egg that must be thrown into the air. And caught in a white cloak? Yes. But just now their holy men are very worried, she said, turning to me, frowning. She looked absurdly like her mother. Why are they worried, Amanda? They have signs from from the ones who can tell the future that there is going to be another very bad happening, and they're going to have to move again, their circle of sacred stones and all the people with all their things. Oh, she cried, clasping her hands to her fair head. I do hope Mom isn't going to cut off all my hair. She said she might do that. Please tell her not to, Mr. Thornycroft. All right, Amanda, don't worry, I'll tell her. Look, she said, cheering up, this is where the cowslips grow. We both picked a bunch and started for home. I was very silent and thoughtful, but Amanda, having had my promise about the hair cutting, skipped along beside me quite lightheartedly with her bunch of cowslips, humming in a tuneless but not unpleasant little voice. I, needless to say, was wondering what to do, and hardly looked where I was going, which is why I didn't hear the car until it was right behind us. It was young, feckless Colin Gaddock, who works at the gas station over at Maynard's Cross. He always comes home at a crazy pace, hell-bent on getting to his evening's enjoyment. His side mare caught the child's jacket as he shot past us, and she was dragged, shrieking, 500 yards up the road before he could break to a stop. He's doing time for manslaughter now. I'd like to think it taught him a lesson, but fear that he's the kind of hopeless lout who will presently come out of jail and do exactly the same thing again. I could never go into a butcher's shop again. The sight of a piece of steak. People said I had a breakdown, and everyone was very sorry for me. But actually, it's simpler than that. What happened was that the Venetia transferred from Amanda's head to mine. And I'm a bit bothered now, because their druids are predicting another catastrophe. The End